there is just one round remaining of the pool stages before we head towards the Rugby World Cup 2023 quarterfinals. New Zealand were the headline from last week's fixtures as they put 96 points past Italy to restate their credentials as tournament contenders. Joining us today to discuss all things World Cup is none other than New Zealand rugby legend Sean Fitzpatrick. Before we kick off this episode of the pod, I just wanted to give a shout out to our friends at Keith Prowse, the UK's leading provider of corporate hospitality experiences. Did you know that they have been offering hospitality experiences at Twickenham since 1979? So they know a thing or two on this. They've got an incredible selection of official hospitality experiences, ranging from a live band, plenty of Guinness on tap, legendary players doing the rounds, some of the best seats in the house to watch the game and loads more. So, if you've got a special occasion coming up that you want to celebrate or a key client you're desperate to impress, make sure you get in touch with Keith Prowse by visiting their website, keithprowse.co.uk forward slash Twickenham. I've heard that they're almost sold out of their island packages already for next year's Guinness Six Nations, so I suggest that you guys hurry. Tournament favourite, Shmi. <laughs> no, we're not. As I said the other night, don't start talking about us now. No, well, we had stopped talking about you a little bit, and I think we were all yeah. guilty. Of, we're good. We're, we're quite happy with that. Well, I exist, for, I exist for a proposition, Sean. Geordie Barrett makes all the difference. Yeah, both those Barretts are crucial to us. Him and uh, his brother Scott is probably oh, more yeah. important, actually. He's probably, I, I think he's probably the number one lock in world rugby at the moment. Massive energy. Huge. Oh, huge my energy. God. Just, just yeah. keeps going, doesn't he? Yeah, yeah. The the thing I like about Geordie, Sean, is uh, we've had this discussion many times on inside centres because there are so many different views on what an inside centre should or should not be, what his skill set should be, what are the most important parts of his skill set. Yeah. And Geordie seems to me, because he's got a game manager's background and he's got that tactical kicking game and he passes long and short and he's big enough to get you through the traffic, yeah. If, if you were inventing an inside centre in a laboratory somewhere, you'd come up with someone who looked a bit like him. Wouldn't yeah, you? yeah, no, he's good. He's been been very good for us. We we need him to play, and I think you know once we once we get into it, it became very evident that we we need basically those twenty three that were there on Friday night. We need every one of them fit because we we if we lose him, we're in real trouble. If we lose if we lose Scott, we're in trouble. Um. We lose Frizzell, we're in trouble. Hmm. Uh, so how, how yeah, good is he? Been? I mean, his his yeah. his uh, his, his uh, graph or whatever it is, his curve is almost vertical yeah. from where he was mm. a year ago. I would think. Yeah. Very good. Well, that's the intro pretty much done. There's sort of no further introduction needed to be made. Sean Fitzpatrick, it's great to have you with us again. Um, Thank you. I'll sort of re-enter the discussion at the Italy front. Um, may as well start with, none of us saw that coming. Did you see that coming to any extent, Sean? You expected a performance, but nearly 100 points past the Tier 1 nation. Yeah, I didn't I didn't quite see that. I've all, I thought it was sort of listening to the, the commentators and, and the commentary coming out of the, the press conferences. Italy not once said they're going to win. Um, they're going to compete, uh, which sort of, Sort of, you know, watching it now, you think back and you think, yeah, they don't they don't play against the All Blacks often. Uh, where when they play France, Wales, Ireland, uh, they play them every year, so they know what to expect. They're not scared, and I think with the All Blacks, it's just a bit of that unknown that we haven't played for a long time, or well, not regularly. And I think they sort of, you know, they struck an All Black team that was, you know, needed to bounce back. And you know, given the break they had, they did a lot of work in, in Bordeaux. had a had a had a big three or four days in Bordeaux, lo- loading a lot of lot of information and a, a lot of tactics, a lot of you know things that they used actually on, against Italy, and a lot of that came off. Uh, but I, I was really impressed. I thought the All Blacks, you know, they just did their job. They, you know, the experience they have in the team, their set piece was outstanding. Uh, their discipline was a lot better than what it was against the French. Uh, in that opening game, and we had the, had the guy we had a full, you know, Foster had an opportunity to pick a, a team from the the thirty three rather than just you know having you know not having Prezel there, and that opening game was a big a big loss. 
uh, and and also against the South Africans two weeks earlier. I think that was a, a big loss. But to, to have Barrett back, uh, to have Rattelet back, although he played twenty minutes um, in the previous game, uh, he he just commands respect and and the the way the line out operated, the sec, you know the scrum operated. Um, just gave gave the Aaron Smiths and Mwanga a great platform to work off. But in saying all that, I know for a fact they're not getting carried away. Uh, they know they've got a massive job in front of them. And um, they're just going to go about their work quietly because no one's talking about them, which is great. People are talking about them though, though now. that You still think that won't phase them? No, I don't think so. They, you know, they've, they've got enough experience. I think they had over 400 caps sitting on the bench against Italy. Uh, so they've got plenty of experience. And when you look back to 2015, which I, I personally thought was the best All Black team to win a World Cup, uh, I just thought that team was outstanding. Right, right, all 33 players, not all 31 in those days. And I, I can just see a little bit of that now in terms of the bench, to have a white lock sitting on the bench, um, to have a Sam Kane sitting on the bench, um, to have a, a Takiaho, who I, who I think is an outstanding hooker, um, possibly sitting on the bench, um, just bodes well. And the bench is, is proving that last 20 minutes, 30 minutes of a game, if you've got a good bench, it seems to be making a difference. In all the big games, um, that bench, um, if your players can't go 80 minutes, and uh, it's lovely to see Ireland actually produce a couple of the big boys went 80 minutes, which I thought was phenomenal. I thought, I thought Porter was outstanding. Um, but if they can do that, well, that's, that's great. Um, but you need you need guys off the bench that can have a real impact. Sure, Sean, you never spent very long on the bench, as as Warren Gatland never ceases to remind everyone uh, when he's not speaking to the Samaritans about it. It's um, uh, with with the Sam Kane thing. Uh, is there is there an issue of having your, uh, your 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 captain, your group captain, more often than not, your match day captain? If he's not going to get in the starting lineup, and I guess there's a decision to be made there, does that cause any kind of problem in the group, or is that just absorbed? No, no by, really, by the group of professionals. No, Chris, they're a, they're a very tight bunch. I, you know, sort of spent a bit of time with them pre the World Cup, and they are very focused. You know, just just take the hookers for example. You know, you got Cody Taylor, Dan Coles, and, and Takiaho, uh, Simasoni Takiaho. And the three of them are like three brothers. They are just doing whatever it takes because all three of them can't be on the bench or on the on the starting twenty three. But just you talk to Dane Coles, and he he is like, I'm going to do whatever it takes, whatever it takes. And if I'm not not on the twenty three, doesn't matter. I'll do whatever I, I can do to help help the other two to make sure they're ready to take on whoever. And I think the balance is really important, and we haven't quite had that in terms of the, the loose forward trio. And they're, they're, they're trying things. And, you know, Papali'i, Sam Kane and and Artie Sabe are all very similar um, in terms of size, I'm talking about, more than what they do on the field. And, I, you know, so obviously we need we need a, a Jerome Kano. Uh, so Shannon Frizzell's fitting, fitting that at the moment. And it's how the other... How the other two work? Who's better off the bench? Who's better coming on with 25, 30 minutes to go? And you know, Papali he has put his hand up, that's for sure. And you know, maybe he's better starting and and Sam coming on, or maybe be vice versa. We'll, we'll maybe see this Thursday night um, what they do there before. Yeah, you know, and ju- just on Frizzell, and just on sorry, Sean, ju- just on Frizzell. I, I mean, going back to to eighty seven and and. And, and your World Cup winning um, year, I mean that that was out of a back row, that all black back row, um, and yeah. and 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 the stars, the people that everyone always talked about were Buck Shelford and Michael Jones, possibly for different reasons, but those were the people who and 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 the six is so often the sort of unsung hero, isn't he? A bit of a yeah. bridesmaid figure. You had the same with Richard Hill when he was with Neil Neil Back and Lawrence Delalio. Alan yeah. Martin was a genuinely great blindside for the, for the amount of time he was at his best. I mean, fantastic. And you played with the guy, Crikey. Just watching him was, it was remarkable. Do you oh, think yeah. so, there was a little bit of that in him? 
Yeah, I think so. I, yeah, but once again, <clears> let's <throat> go back to the balance. You need that balance where they need to complement each other. And and Shelford, Michael Jones, and Alan went and complemented each other. But they also gave us line out options, yeah. which I think think is really important. Also, yeah, we had, we had, yeah Michael could have jumped anywhere in the line out. Uh, Buck, Buck was a bit limited, um, <laughs> but AJ AJ commanded the back of the line out. So um, yeah. you know, and you know, you look at another great you know 2015 was Reed McCaw, Kano, oh. you know, just just yeah. perfect as it was in 2011 uh, yeah. yeah 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 but um, Shelford sure could stop other people jumping mind you <laughs> we didn't I don't know if we used to jump in those days do we <laughs> well, well not, not I don't think anyone jumped if he was there because if he said don't jump I think everyone stayed rooted to the floor didn't they yeah we had a thing, we had a thing the other night Maggie Alfonsi was, was was explaining to our viewers what a jackal was and she had, I said, you have to explain to me what a jackal is. And now, Dave, you touch the ball, that was it. You got, you know, you wouldn't put your hands anywhere near the ball. <laughs> you know, those were the days. What, um, Pitty? What's what's the situation with Lomax at the moment? Because um, obviously, Lau Lala has come in at uh, at tight head. Obviously, the crucial position. Scrummaging wise, what's the position with Lomax? And is he the guy with, that you'd like to see in there? When it comes, yeah, he's a he's quite special, really. They've done a they've done a great job uh, in the last sort of sort of eighteen months, Nick, in terms of developing another group of, of props to come through and De Groot, uh, Lomax. They are you know and this guy Williams who who came on made his debut the other night. Um, they are they are special because they can you know the traditional scrummaging props fantastic, but you need them to be able to do that. But then they need to be able to give you options. You know, you look at look at Retallick the other night, playing in the midfield. You know, he was he was he was the distributor in the midfield, and that's what that's what Lomax to Groot. Um, you know, Lomax has got a massive engine on him, and I was I was pleased the other night he got a bit of time. He had a terrible gash on his leg from the South African game, and that seems seems to be okay. So we're we're in good shape in those. You know. I go back to that set piece again. If we can get our set piece right, if we can compete with the big boys um, for 80 minutes and, and scrummage, line out, and, and then compete at the breakdown, uh, it's it's a huge step in the right direction um, in terms of giving you a platform to operate off. And that, when you look at you look at South Africa, you look at Ireland, you look at France, the big three at the moment, they all have good set piece. They which. When you get when you get exposed a couple of times, you know even the, even the French got exposed in that second game against who did they play? Um, Uruguay was it? Uruguay, I think. Yeah. yeah, they just got into them a bit, just unsettled them, and it just changes changes the complexion and the momentum in the game. What, how much has changed um, with the All Blacks? Do you think since uh, they were beaten by the Irish in uh, the series in New Zealand? We were saying it the other night on TV. Actually, it's been it's been interesting listening to the commentary in terms of of how the All Blacks deal with it because they've been asked questions which we're, we've never been asked before in terms of have we lost our aura? Um, you know, are they not you know, number four in the world now? They're not the best team in the world. All these questions, sort of doubting doubting our players. You know, in terms of world class players, do we have world class players? Um, Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera, which which is good, but it's it's very unusual for us, and it's how we deal with that now. And and I'm pleased to say the other night they just they went away. They didn't they didn't take any time off on their bye week. Um, they weren't they weren't going to Disneyland and all those sort of places. They they were just focused on on loading information, practicing because uh, they are a determined bunch. They are hugely uh, determined to do well. And they've got big questions, and and they've got big games in front of them. So I think it's exciting. I've you know I've really enjoyed watching them develop, really, because South Africa at Twickenham was a big shot. That was the sort of wake up call that we weren't expecting. We thought we'd sort of fixed those those physical uh, issues that we had in terms of competing with the big boys, um, and we got a bit of a wake up call. 
It's nice to see you didn't go partying, Sean, on the, um, not you personally, but the, 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 the All Blacks on the, um, on their week off. I think I'm right in saying in 95, before you put 800 points uh, past England in the semi-final in 10 minutes, um, most of them from Jonah, I think England went to Sun City. Right, okay. For some downtime. For some downtime, I it's a lot of it revolves around, you know, in terms of the leadership within the team. And, you know, our guys just felt that we needed to, you know, because we haven't got, and no disrespect to the teams we're playing, you know, we played France and then, you know, we, we thought Italy would be a bit more of a challenge than it was and no disrespect to them. But, you know, that was, you know, they came across an all-back team that played very well. So we needed to we needed to load some some competition, and uh, I think they sort of had a few games against each other um, in Bordeaux, and and worked on a few things that you know seem to be going in the right direction. Because now now Chris, we have we have real competition in, in a lot of positions. You know, mm-hmm. when we've got we've got the All Black captain sitting on the bench. You know, is that a bad thing? Maybe not. On a broader perspective, Sean, how worrying is it that Italy? Uh, ship 96 points to you at a World Cup. I I, I mean, the Italians have, have come on over the last couple of seasons. Kieran Crowley's done a brilliant job by common consent. They played a different brand of rugby. It suited them, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Yes, they got nilled again in the Six Nations, but they were competitive uh, in, in the majority of those games. To, to go down by nearly 100 against you in a big World Cup game for them, massive World Cup game, if they get another toweling against a sort of Dupontless um, France mm-hmm. this week, how much do you think psychologically that would set them back? Because I'm not sure that world rugby can afford tier one sides to go sliding down the far side of the mountain too fast. Yeah, I, I didn't. To be honest, because I didn't see that coming either. I, I was expecting a much bigger challenge from the Italians. And yeah, you know, once again they just they just struck an all black team that got into into the right groove. And you know, I don't think many teams you know would have lived with with the All Blacks the way they were playing yeah. that type of rugby. So you know, I, I felt real. I was sitting with Sergio Perez. He was he was devastated. Mm-hmm. Um, he didn't make he didn't make the point that maybe maybe they're focusing on the French, <laughs> uh, <laughs> which you know. They're... Well, you don't want to peak too soon, do you? Um, but. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I, I, you know, it's a concern because you know, although although everyone enjoyed watching, well, we enjoyed watching the All Blacks play well. Um, no, we we want competitive games. Like I thought yesterday's game, um, uh, South Africa Samoa, Tonga was an out, was an outstanding Tonga, sorry, was an yeah. outstanding game of rugby. Mm. You know, yeah. the Tongans, the Tongans really threw it at them, and the the South Africans had to play well to keep them. You know, there's a couple of easy tries that they let through, but you know, Tonga, I thought were were superb, and I think we're yeah, and that's probably where we're seeing a real benefit in terms of those those teams, Pacific Islands, the Fijis of the world, Tonga, Samoa, are really benefiting from their players. You know, I think almost sort of seventy percent, eighty percent of the Fijian team play in the top fourteen. Yeah. Um, so they're getting real experience uh, from playing in this part of the world, and we're seeing the benefits. This, this the Fijian team, although they weren't great the other night, um, I, 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 they're the real deal. They, when they when they get going, they they do all the things that they didn't used to do. You know, in terms of a yep. good set piece, good defensively, well organised, fit, um, and not just playing sevens rugby. So, the thing is, though, the thing is, though, Sean. Um, I mean, I, I completely agree with you. I mean, generally in World Cups, at least one of the island sides shows, and, and one of the island sides yeah. seems to be a bit of disappointment. Um, uh, but on on this occasion, Tonga have had their moments. Samoa have been fairly competitive, and we we know about Fiji. But um, a lot of it's down to time preparation, and a lot of it is down to exposure to the top level. And with this Nations Cup idea. With the with yeah. the theoretical uh, ex, um, the theoretical exception of Fiji, who we think are going to be part of the twelve, it's mm-hmm. not for sure, but we think they're going to be part of the twelve. Mm-hmm. Those other sides aren't going to get a tier one match for eleven and money. They're going to get uh, fewer tier one matches than yeah. they have now. Yeah, um, we saw that with the Argentinian game. Who did they play? Argentina played Chile. Um, the last Chile. Who? Chile. Chile. 
Yeah. Chile, yeah. The, the, what Argentina had had 34 games since the last World Cup and Chile had had 10, yeah. you know, internationals. Um, do you know the other thing I, I really like about Fiji is a gentleman who I used to play against, a guy called Simon Radluni, uh, is coaching them. Ah. And we were just talking, we were talking about it, uh, Johnny Wilkinson and I were just talking about it um, the other night before our game. Is It's really important. Well, I think you have a uh, somebody from your home nation uh, coaching you, because Simon, especially a team like Fiji, he understands them. Where where maybe other coaches who aren't from Fiji wouldn't understand if they need a rest or they need to go and have a lie down or they need to do extra training or they need to oh. do whatever whatever they do. But a Fijian will know that. So Simon will be, you know, and it's and it's paid dividends. He's, you know, which, I, which I think so is a really, calm. really nice thing. He seems so calm with everything. Yeah, well. just, I mean, yeah, I mean, he's, yeah. he's, I mean we, we've seen Fijian coaches in the past. Some of them are sort of New Zealand. Dave Waterson, I think, was probably, he was sort of in, involved with one of the island side, certainly at World Cups. And it was just like, you know, you'd like the blue touch paper. After a game, he'd rant about the ref or he'd rant about the, uh, about the schedule or the inequities of the whole international system, all that stuff. And, and, and Simon just seems to be completely comfortable in his own skin with that particular side and, as you say, knows how to press their buttons. Yeah, and they're, so <laughs> they're winning. It makes a big difference in the terms of uh, coaching uh, uh, demeanour, I think, after games. But look, yeah, true. I wanted to, um, to come back to Italy. I actually think that what Kieran Crowley's done there has been... Um, has been exceptional in many ways. And I mm. think that the timing of the game against New Zealand, uh, there are no excuses ultimately, but the timing of the game against New Zealand, they caught a New Zealand side that really had yeah. a point to prove. And what I noticed, I think that they scored, New Zealand scored something that I don't think there's any other team that when they get on a roll are quite so um, so you know, savage, really, in terms of putting people away. They yeah. scored five tries, I think, in about, it looked, it seemed like about 10 minutes. It might have been a mm -hmm. little bit more. But they were unrelenting. And it was almost like watching somebody on the ropes, not able to get off them in a boxing ring. Mm -hmm. Um so it 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 was lopsided and you you got the feeling that the Italians were punch drunk. Um, and I, I'm not sure that they gave the best representation of themselves in that game. Um, and another day, it might have been a more difficult, uh, a difficult task for New Zealand. But um, I, I think that Italy, I, I don't see, I, I really hope that we won't see Italy go into free fall. I think that their captain, Lamoureux, is a, 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 a really sound head. And and a pretty good player as well, and mm -hmm. hopefully they'll get you know back on back on track fairly quickly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I think that every, everything from what I hear, Karen Crowley is a, is very liked. Um, he probably in terms of what he did when he was coaching, I think Treviso was it Treviso he was coaching or Benetton. Yeah, he did some really good stuff there, um, and unfortunately, he's, coming, but he's leaving. But he's leaving. I mean, it was a, re it's a yeah. re it's a really weird time. To, I mean, I don't yeah. I don't know what went on there, but no. you know, to yeah. say shortly before a World Cup that he's off ski. Yeah, um, it, it, it's Italian it's Italian politics, but um, you know the thing. <laughs> <laughs> of course, we don't have yeah. politics in other rugby nations, do we? What, what, uh, what, what, you mean the ma you mean the mafia involved? <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying that that's Italian politics, but. Um, yeah. You know, I, I think the thing about it is, is that the game that he wants to play and the game that he's put in, in a way, they were ready made for the All Blacks because I, I think that their expansive game, they're still trying to play from their own, you know, from deep in their own half a lot of the time. They make mis mistakes um, where other teams don't punish it quite so, so, so harshly. Yeah. Yeah. New Zealand will absolutely shred you if you do that. And yeah. I think a lot of that is what happened. Sean, I just want to um, go back to something that we were discussing right at the start of the pod. And that was when you said that the All Blacks are not favourites. Now, the sort of discussion, I'm going to paint it quite bin 
in a quite a binary manner whereby it wasn't binary. But after the France New Zealand game, you would think that the top three favourites were New Zealand, South Africa, Ar- sorry, France, South Africa, Ireland. And well, we had discussions on the podcast and you kind of would just flip a coin and see what lands up in terms of asking who, you know, could change at any given moment. Where do you think the All Blacks now factor in? Do you still think they're that sort of outside fourth spot? Well, it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't really matter where we are now because we're, we're going to play, looks like, Ireland in the quarterfinal. Um, so we're playing the best team in the world and currently ranked number one in the world. So it doesn't really matter where we're ranked. Um, you know, we're going to have to be at our best to, to beat them because they're, they're in good shape. And, you know, what they did to South Africa, it was, it was, I suppose there's always question marks. And the confidence they took out of that game and talking to fellow pundits uh, is huge. They, they feel as though now they, they've got what it takes. Um, so they've got, a, they've got a belief for it. And that's, you know, before they beat the All Blacks a number of years ago, 2016, they didn't think they could beat the All Blacks. Uh, now they've got the majority of that team have been involved in teams that have beat on the All Blacks. Uh, so you can take that away in terms of the belief that they can't beat the All Blacks. Um, they know they can. So it's going to be one hell of a match. And, you know, they know us, we know them. Uh, they know where we're vulnerable. Hopefully we know where they're vulnerable if there are, is any any places. Um, and then, you know, I, I, you know, then you've got the other, the other quarterfinal is, you know, the other two best teams in the world <laughs> um, with South Africa and, and France. And I, I think that will be a proper match. And not saying that the Ireland New Zealand game might be, but what we saw against South Africa and Ireland, um, you could probably take that to a, another degree when you, you if you put if Dupont is available, which I think that is a big factor. Um, they are. I, I honestly, I I know the the Irish are ranked number one in the world, but the French team that I've seen in the last eighteen months, and especially when I saw them beat the All Blacks in the Stade de France. Uh, exceptional they are, they are an exceptional team when you say Sean we're, we're, we or, or New Zealand are playing uh, the best team in the world was that um, a sort of statement of fact based on rankings or was that a Graham Henry we're playing the best team in the world kind of well I know I, I, on, ra- on rankings and, and on you know in the last 18 months they're definitely <laughs> the best team in the world they've beaten everyone yeah where so, and I, and they've got they've got world class players. You know, if you if you want to be the best team in the world, you've got to have world class players, and they've got a number of world class players. Yeah, where are they better? Do you think, Sean, uh, than when they won the series in New Zealand? Where have they Where have they got better? Where have they improved? Where have they improved? Um, I think they're, they've probably got a bit more depth than what they had when they were in New Zealand. In, in positions in terms of off the bench. Um, I think they're probably... Um, their physicality is always... You know, that's one thing that got us you know, two years ago, was it? When, you know, just after COVID, they, they sort of exposed us a bit there, that physical side of it. Um, but I, I... Honestly, Nick, I think the area they've got better is they've got belief. They, they know they've got players, you know, if they can, like us, I think they, they need a bit of luck to be to make sure they all stay fit. If they lost a Porter or a Furlong or a, or a Johnny, and like France, you know, losing to Pont is going to change the shape of their game without, without question. So it, they all need a bit of luck, really. And we, we thought, need a bit of luck. As I said I right thought, at the start, I said we need our best 23. I thought two big, steps, two big steps up for them against, against South Africa, Sean. Uh, one was that Josh van der Fleer, who, I mean, he, he wasn't World Player of the Year for nothing, but I, th- yeah. I thought he'd just been two, three percent quieter in recent matches than he had been when he was absolutely playing the house down. I thought he was right back on it, right back on it against South Africa. I thought he was terrific on both sides of the ball. And Bundy Aki, that, that's got to be mm. a massive difference to how I'm in the play. And I mean, he's, he's yeah. just in the form of his life, isn't he? Yeah, that's Three Kiwis, very good ones. Jameson Gibson. <laughs> <laughs> and low. <laughs> no. 
they're they're yeah you know, they're the they've been they've been outstanding. You know, James Lowe is just phenomenal. What he's what he's been doing is you know, no, I yeah, you go through the whole whole, whole team, Chris, and you know, you it's hard to go past each position without saying world class. You know, I think mean, so, Sexton's on a mission as well, Sean. I um, you know, he, he's from now on, he's one game away from the end of his career. And I yeah. think he's in a bit of an inspired mood. And actually, he seems to have learned something in old age. I, that match against um, South Africa, he captained, was brilliant. His captaincy was brilliant. Um, and at one stage, he was talking to Ben O'Keefe, and Ben O'Keefe was coaching the box. He was doing the the old, um, you're offside, stand back, get back number nine. And he went up to him, and I thought he's going to blow his top here. And he didn't. He just said, Ben... You're coaching. You've got you've got to penalise these guys. And Ben said, yeah, "You're right." <laughs> and Ireland got the next four penalties. Yeah. Um, so he he's in he's in you know. Well, he, he's probably he's, he's probably the same same age as Nick Berry, <laughs> Ben O'Keefe. <laughs> <laughs> he's older than some refs. It's when, it's when he it's when he goes up to the referee and says, "Look, young man." <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Do you think, no, do you think Sean, we we mentioned Dupont? Do you think, and look, they're, they're shit in heaven and earth to get the guy back, and 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 they probably will. Um, and he, he he won't be passed to play unless he's unless you know in in theoretical medical terms or in practical medical mm. medical terms he's fit to play. But the psychology's got to play something there, hasn't it? I mean, that's you know, I'm I'm sure he's a tough nut, but um, a fractured cheekbone is a, a fractured cheekbone in anyone's language, and even if it just takes half percent off of him, then. Yeah, you think of the way you think of the way he plays, Chris. Too, he's very, very, very much in taking the ball to the line. Yeah, yeah. Um, which you know, hopefully, hopefully, I was I was really upset when he got, when he got injured yeah. and, and it's announced because he the, the way he played in that game when he got injured. Oh my, my god, he was just out of this world. And I, I just as a, as a fan of rugby, we we need to see him play because um, I just think he's he's special. That was almost as good a kicking game as Zin's hand. <laughs> Sean, you've mentioned where Ireland are strong. Obviously, as a New Zealander yourself, you've got to go into that game thinking they're beatable, despite having beaten everyone, like you say, in the last 18 months. In what scenario are they beatable? What has to happen for the All Blacks to beat them? Well, what happened, needs to happen is the All Blacks need to, need to play well. It, it, we need to the teams that are that are playing, you know, you know France against the All Blacks and in, in the opening game. Um, we had opportunities that we didn't take in that first half. Um, they didn't play that well in the first sort of fifty minutes, um, but they just stuck at their game plan. They trusted their systems, um, and which is very, very unFrench from my day, and and they they got the result. And and unfortunately, the All Blacks just couldn't get into the attacking zone. They couldn't get into the twenty-two. Uh, they, you know, they gave away a lot of penalties. And when you give away a lot of penalties, you, you can't build pressure. And that's that's what the Irish do so well. They just don't don't make mistakes. The South Africans are the same when they're on their game. They just keep building pressure. Just keep knocking on the door, knocking on the door, and eventually the door opens. And that's what you know. The Irish have done so well in the last eighteen months, um, and and they're fit. You know, they're, they're they're fit. You know, the the French are fit. The South Africans are fit. Mm. Yeah. You, L- you, luckily, the All Blacks are fit. Yeah, it's interesting, Sean. You've you've obviously got the Uruguayans. Um, they've got Scotland, Ireland. Yep. Yep. Well, that's um, you know significant. Uh, uh, the Uruguayans are a, a, a rugged side, no question. But um, the Ireland Scotland game is. Do you do you consider it to be a potential banana skin? Yeah. Well, they, the Scots have got nothing to lose, have they? You know, they've, they've they've targeted this game, I'd imagine. Um, Ireland's come off some big games, so. You know, and then and then six days later, they're playing a quarter final. If yeah. whoever gets whoever gets through there, um, and it's so, not afford to rest people really against the against the Scots. You, you you'd think the that. Irish. I, I would imagine that Irish will play their their best team. They have to. You know, this this Scottish team is very capable. Yeah, you know, as they've shown. I think I think the All Blacks said in the autumn last year when they played them that. 
the, the Scottish Ford pack was the toughest Ford pack they played against all year. You know, at half time, James Ryan said the All Blacks were out on their feet. The only good thing was, <laughs> so were the Scots. You know, um, the, the yeah, psychology was, of that game is fascinating, isn't it? Because unlike you were talking about the Italy's approach to the All Blacks um, a few days ago, Scotland really won't. Uh, uh, um, Scotland really won't be scared of Ireland. I mean, there's, no, there's nothing to be scared about. They play them every year. Yeah. They're competitive every yeah. year. They probably lose a few more than they're winning um, in recent times. But, I mean, I mean, it's not it's not one of those games where a single Scot is going to sit in the dressing room before the game and think, Christ, we're up against it today. That's a winnable game for them. It, that has yeah. to be. has to genuinely... So me- mental, the mental preparation is crucial. The, mind, the mindset, you know, they're all, you know, those top five, six teams, seven teams. They're all as fit as each other. They're all as big as each other. Um, maybe the South Africans are a little bit bigger, but uh, it's it's how how this how you prepare yourself, how you turn up, how you deal with the situation. Yeah, and te- teams are getting better at it. You, you look at the the big boys; they know how to deal with not good situations, and that's purely yeah. through dust. Yeah, one of the and, and with a bit of ball, with a bit of ball. I mean, Scotland have Finn Russell and Darcy Graham, who are who are gloriously unpredictable. I mean, they yeah. can, you know, we we often say that Ireland understand their game, but it's a bit more difficult to understand the Scots game if you're if you're Irish if those two blokes are given the ball in a bit of space. That Vandermeer's not bad either, is he? Well, he's 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 just big and South African. <laughs> no, no. King Horn, he's all right. <laughs> no, they're good. No, they're good. They're, they're, they're pretty good. You know, they got what, do you, what, do you, what do you guys think? Who's going to win the quarterfinals? On our I think Ireland will win it, but uh, Ireland, sorry, will, Ireland will get through, but that they could at a cost. And I, I said this a couple of weeks ago in, in, in 2015, they 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 were battered when they played New Zealand. Now they were nowhere near in New Zealand's class, but um, no, sorry, not Ireland. When they played Argentina, they were battered because mm-hmm. they'd gone to war with France six days yeah. earlier, and they were missing four players. They got four players injured in that game, and there was another three or four who probably were walking wounded going against the Argentinians. Um, and France, they were battered, and they got absolutely taken apart by, obviously, the best side in the world that year anyway. So I think this Scotland game is going to be quite pivotal for Ireland's chances in the entire tournament. So that's New Zealand to win the uh, quarterfinal against Ireland, is it, Brent? <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that's what I was asking. Yeah. <laughs> Are we getting round to it? Yes, that was the excuse. <laughs> I, th- I think I think New Zealand win the tournament, but I I I see. Oh I my god! Them. Oh I, no! Don't start I, saying I that. Yes. Before, I tipped them before the tournament, and believe me, you know I'm not called Nostradamus for nothing. Yeah, you, you <laughs> are called Nostradamus. You're right. <laughs> I, I honestly, I honestly think the all black see their from, chances down from, all the way. In. <laughs> from from eight to fi- from eight to fifteen, the All Blacks are the best side in the tournament. I, I think the the two teams that win the quarterfinals on our side will go through to the final. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Unless that's, they, that's probably they, a better way. That's a better way to put it. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's. I just wanted to ask you about the Uruguay game, Sean, because you mentioned that it's essential that New Zealand have their best 23 to face. And we should say that, obviously, we're talking about Ireland against New Zealand because that is what is looking likely at this point. But they could still face Scotland. They could still face South Africa. I think there's a a, a scenario in which they face South Africa. It's based on tiny little four-point differences or something. Um, Anyway, thinking about that quarterfinal and keeping your best 23, you obviously still need to win and win convincingly against Uruguay. If you're Ian mm-hmm. Foster, how are you juggling that balance? Because if an Ardy or a Bowden or a Rico take a knock, that's obviously a huge loss for that quarterfinal. Yeah, I think he, I, I think against Italy, they that was their best twenty three. I think uh, so. They've, they've they've done that, um, and now it's an opportunity to. Who, to give some other players game time, and you need to win a World Cup. You need thirty-three players, and you know whoever gets the job. Whether you're asking whether you would play his best twenty-three again, or, against close to it, or rather what we saw against. Yeah, I think well, there's certain combinations that he wanted want to see. I thought 
I tell you who played really well against um, Italy was Roy Gard, the nine, who's you know he may he may may get an opportunity to start um, just to to give him a bit of um, Damien McKenzie was good again, um, so so off the bench he, he's showing what he can do, um, and that's when you look at 2015 again our bench was outstanding, um, you know Bowden Barrett was off the bench in 2015, so. Um, there's enough enough players there to you know without having a drop off in performance, but they need to they need to play well again. Just need to keep keep the momentum going. The momentum shift has has come back again, and we're you know we're in, we're in good shape. Uh, we've got no injuries from that game, which is great. And you know we don't need any cards. That's a, you know cards cards could be a killer in this last week, so we need to be really careful. Yeah. Just talking about about All Blacks who've sort of come come from nowhere almost. Is the, the guy on the wing, Mark, has been playing. Yeah. He's probably been the he plays for the Blues, uh, Nick, and 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 he's probably been the form winger in the country this year and even last year on the and he's, uh, last year he was was outstanding also. Uh, but he just he just can't tackle him. He's he's like he's slippery and you know, but just you know when you think you know you've got. Um, Clark, uh, Caleb Clark, sitting there hasn't, hasn't sort of featured really. Played one game, I think. Um, we've got some very good wingers. You know, I, I still see Will Jordan as a as a fifteen. That's probably you know he's he's just been outstanding on the wing, and he and he gives us that kicking option along with Bodie uh, Barrett. You get you know Will Jordan. You got you know, then you've got uh, Geordie Barrett who can kick at twelve, and then my wing are also. So we've got four four first receivers that can. Can kick, um, which is a which is a huge plus. Sean, I know you need to get going in a couple of minutes. Um, Sam Whitelock, very very quickly, obviously one of the headlines from the last. Game. Um, can I just get you to sort of sum up that sort of achievement? Obviously, seven years ago or whatever it was when Richie McCaw um, retired with 148 caps, we didn't think it would probably be <laughs> this. Right. And it has been so. Yeah, just sort of sum it up. He's just been a, he's been an amazing servant of the game in New Zealand. He's you know he's been a one club man. Uh, played for the Crusaders, done unbelievable things with the Crusaders, and and he's he's one of our great All Blacks without without question. Him and him and Bodie Retallick have been the heart of of the All Blacks scrum for so long. Um, so yeah, I take my hat off to him. And he's once as we said at the start, he's. He's just happy to be part of that twenty-three, and whatever, whether it's off the bench or whether it's starting, his his leadership is crucial. Just his his wiseness. Uh, he's only thirty-four years old, um, so you know he'll be doing everything he can to to get another World Cup. And the notion that he could be the first player to win three, yeah, true. Yeah, I mean yeah. he's he's the only guy he's the only guy who can do it um, in the tournament. You know, as it stands, yeah. so. Um... I, I I I've got a massive amount of respect for Whitelock. I I I think that just the mechanics of his game, yeah, he is completely dependable. Completely dependable. I'm just trying to think. I thought I was going to say Aaron Smith, but Terry Whipu was the uh, yeah the 2011, exactly. wasn't he? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't think I don't think Aaron was in the squad. No, he uh, wasn't. he wasn't. Do uh, you think Whitelock will be targeting another four years? I guess uh, he's going. To, he's going to Poe. Okay. And okay. French, French. Top yeah, yeah. Is, you think he'll be trying to make the next World Cup cycle anyway at the age of at Johnny Sexton territory? No, I don't yeah. think that. I think he's he's served his time. Give him a break. <laughs> Sorry, no, no, no. I does. I I thought I misinterpreted what you said. I thought you said he's targeting another World Cup, as in beyond France. No, you, no, no. Targeting no, no. winning a third. Okay. I don't think so. <laughs> I was going to say. Okay. Yeah. Um, one other thing I wanted to very quickly ask you, and you do not have to answer, but I wanted to know, obviously, two potential quarterfinal um, opponents in Ireland and South Africa. If you could take, and this is the last thing I'll ask, I promise. If you could take one South Africa and one Ireland player to put in the All Black squad, who would you put? One South African and one Ireland? Yeah. Oh, God. I, I wouldn't take anything. No. How, could I, how could I do that? Why would I do that to my All Blacks? 
There speaks in all. There speaks uh, in all black. <laughs> yeah. wouldn't, wouldn't touch any of them with a barge pole. <laughs> I won't press any further, Sean. I'll let you get going. Um, yeah, I. You're, when are you flying back out to France? Uh, we're there for the quarterfinals. So we go. We can train across there on the Friday. Amazing. And we're going to Paris. We're doing Paris. So Saturday, Sunday, Paris. That'll be a huge weekend. And, so. and you guys will all be down in Marseille, I assume. <laughs> Unfortunately, not. But we will. In, you know, in, in, in spirit. If you if you think the rugby paper has got the funds to send us anywhere beyond <laughs> our, anywhere beyond our respective front doors, you must be mad. Perfect. Well, they're much nicer at home, isn't it? You know, sitting in front of the TV, you can have a, a drink what you like, eat what you like, no crowds. Yeah. yeah. Right, Sean. Thank you so much. Okay, guys. Take care. That didn't, that didn't go down too well, did it with you? <laughs> <laughs> We're missing it, mate. We're missing it. <laughs> no, you smug it's bastard. Easy to say when you're <laughs> <up in Barry. laughs> okay, boys. Thank you. Cheers, Sean. Bye, Cheers. 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 Thanks so Cheers. much, Sean. Right, guys. We've barely even got on to the other pools, uh, <laughs> but I reckon. Been a send off. Yeah. <laughs> Do you think he'll come back? <laughs> I didn't think that was that bad a question to ask him. It was, I, 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 I could have safely predicted the answer. Yeah, I know, I know. So could I, but it's always worth. As, as soon as he says, "I want Eben Etzebeth, Etzebeth," then Brody Vitalik's on the phone saying, "You've just done me like a kipper." Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I've definitely asked worse questions on the Rugby Paper podcast, that's for sure. So, anyway, let's go to Pool B, and we've touched upon, um, well, obviously. Ireland, Scotland, so I won't talk about that one too much more. Um, let's talk about South Africa's Tonga. It was obviously a hell of a game. Crucially, Brandon, Andre Pollard, well, he didn't miss a kick and he didn't really put a foot wrong. Is the 10 shirt now his off the basis of that? Yeah, I think it is. I mean, he does what he does and it, we're now into knockout tournament rugby and, you know, they've got him back into the squad by hook or by crook and I think, you know, the template is there now. Um like you, I thought it was a hell of a good match. And my thought from that match actually was, no wonder the big teams don't want Tonga playing um, Tier 1 opposition very regularly. I mean, that was only their third match against Tier 1 opposition since the last World Cup, I think. And they've got better and better. And by the end of this tournament, they will be a bloody good, fully-fledged team. If they could just get some proper matches in between World Cups... Um, you know, how many other sides are going to score three tries against the Springboks this time round? Not many, I'd say. Um, and a fantastic advert for the championship. If uh, the RFU are watching, they, they 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 were they were terrific last night, weren't they? I mean, they they still had nearly about forty nine points stuck on. So, um, you know, you, you look at the results on a bit of paper and you think, well, that's a toweling. And it wasn't quite like that, as we as we know. Not at all. But but I mean, this whole Nations Cup thing and the exclusion of the, and and the further exclusion of tier two nations is a shocker and world rugby have dodged a bullet because if uruguay had played the second half of their game against italy as well as they played the first half or if italy hadn't come out with a little bit more buzz about them uruguay would have finished third that means they would have had automatic qualification in the next world cup and no fixtures no fixtures for four years Whereas Italy would have continued to play Six Nations rugby and had a rather, you know, a, a, a much more sort of elite form of, um, of preparation for this stuff. So, again, I just think in, in terms of all this, you know, everything connects in rugby, as we know. I just think that there, we're, we're so far down the wrong path with some of this. We, we're, we're still expecting these teams to rock up once every four years, play the house down, and then put up with second-class citizenship until the next tournament comes around. And whichever way you cut it, totally. that's what's going totally. And it's, a sh it's shocking. It's a shocking indictment of the governance of the game. Uh, one other little thing before we... Um, Luke, Luke Pierce had a terrific match, I thought. But I thought he got that first try wrong. He'd um, he signaled a penalty, but he was still on the move with his back to the, the box. He hadn't made the mark. So there was no mark to tap and go through. Now... Scum halves do this all the time. They get away with bloody murder. If you're taking a tap penalty, you've got to take it from the right bloody place. And the law says you've got to tap the ball through the mark. And I don't think I've seen a scum half do that in about 15 years. 
And that one was a particularly bad one. Luke Pearce still had his back to him. He still hadn't sorted it out. And he should have pulled that back. That was He's a very good ref. And I think he might be the best ref here. And he might get the World Cup if England go, go all the way. But that was a really bad call by him. And five minutes later, they tried to do it again. And he immediately shut them down. And he realised he'd made a mistake. I th- yeah, that was my reading of it. I agree with I agree with that completely. <laughs> Just on a slightly lighter note, you say that if Uruguay had finished third, Uruguay can still actually qualify for the knockout stages. And I decided not to say this when Sean Fitzpatrick was here. But if they beat New Zealand by eighty points, <laughs> they, well, it, they can go through. <laughs> I'd like to say stranger things have happened, but they haven't, have they? Really? <laughs> but, no. That would have been. <laughs> That's up there with spotting Elvis, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Question them which South African <laughs> or Irish <laughs> you have in your team or Frenchman. <laughs> that 150 year old loose head prop from Uruguay after have a game, isn't he? <laughs> <laughs> old Sanguinetti. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what a what a. Someone find me know, the I... odds for Uruguay to beat the New Zealand by 80. You heard it here first. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, and we may not hear it again. <laughs> yeah, you heard it here last as well. <laughs> um, uh, let's talk about Scotland Ireland very, very briefly before just a little bit on Pool D and Pool C. Um, obviously, South Africa are now powerless. Darcy Graham, we talk about him, um, or we spoke about him earlier and his unpredictability. Let's not forget, Chris, that he actually wasn't the holder of that 14 shirt in the in the first couple of games of the World Cup when Scotland were fielding their first team. It was Carl Stain. And technically it still is Carl Stain. I presume you would now make that change. I think they I, I think they'd be fairly um I think it would be fairly weird of Gregor, who was a fair bit of a um an off the cuff maverick when he when it suited him as a player. I think it'd be very strange if they didn't pick Darcy Graham because he's a city it's a spark. I mean, for Scotland to beat Ireland, and, and we've talked so often about the Irish understanding their own game and they're, and they're quite process-driven. That's not to demean them. Some of the great sides in, in rugby history have been process-driven. They're, they're not much of an off-the-cuff side, give it to the odd Mac Hansen. They're not, they're not an off-the-cuff side. I don't think Scotland, I don't think Scotland out processing, but I think Scotland do have it in them to ask some questions that they don't expect to be asked. And one of the pe- people who is best equipped to ask questions like that is Darcy Graham. Yeah, I think that that's that that's that's true. You know, I mean, he he's exceptional. You know, in just in terms of being able to uh, use his feet to bamboozle and so on. But in the game against South Africa, uh, the Scots carved out a clear opportunity, and Darcy yeah, yeah. missed an overlap. And those are the sorts of opportunities that they cannot afford to waste against Ireland if they're to stand a prayer. So, you know, I I, I, I think Carl, uh, Carl Stain has been playing extremely well. And I, I wouldn't have seen him missing that overlap. So I, I think... I, I think that it's... A, I think that it's a, it's a, it's a difficult selection... What you would say is you'd want to see both of them on the pitch at, at you know, at some stage, for sure. Well, I, I mean, and, and in fairness, I mean, I know it was only Romania and, and they've been tragic, sadly. Um, but you have to say that people like Chris Harris and and um, Hamish, I mean, Hamish Watson really did come onto the field like a bloke who's saying, I've got 40, 50 minutes to absolutely make a case for myself here, he he played like an angry player actually, um, and he and it and it showed, and he was very very effective, albeit against not very much. So I do th- I do think Greg has got some some interesting selection calls to make. Um, you know, Chris Harris is a hell of a defensive centre, and there's and there's a lot to be said for that against them. Um, against a side like Ireland, which has just gone away to my last argument about Scotland having to produce something off the cuff or up out of the box, because that's what Hugh Jones did at his best. Mm. So it's, um, yeah, they're, they're, it's an awkward selection for Tangent, I think. It's quite difficult. What does this mean for Townsend if Scotland lose? Because although he is potentially taking the best Scotland team there's ever been to a World Cup, and he certainly takes a great deal of credit in the time he's had as Scotland coach, 
that's two World Cups and two World Cup exits. Do you think someone loses patience, i.e. either him or the, the powers above? So I think he's signed a new contract, doesn't he? Oh, has he? Has he? Yeah. Oh, but yeah, but that, that means that means nothing in, in, in the yeah. world of sport. I mean, I, I, I think Gregor had every... There was every reason for Gregor to feel... Uh, for, for any criticism aimed at Gregor insofar as he's the head man, so he has to pop it. In 2019, I thought Scotland were very disappointed. Um, they were really disappointed in the game he played against Ireland, and of course they lost to Japan. I don't think I don't think they'll be queuing out of the doors at Murrayfield to condemn Gregor if Scotland don't quite get out of this group, because it's an absolute pig of a group. No, and the, the and yeah. and the other thing is is that they're you know they're a side that is is making you know is improving sort of year on year. So you know the idea of sort of moving a coach on who's actually improving a side. And and bringing them up to a standard where they're fifth in the world, uh, you know, in in terms yeah. of, I think you'd you'd be mad. Yeah, yeah, I agree with all of that. I just thought it 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 was it was worth mentioning. Um, does I mean, that... in one way you're right, Ollie. Because not many coaches get two World Cup campaigns, and you know don't make the quarterfinals and get away with it. In one way you're right, but he has he seems a lot between world cups and there's nobody on this planet who would really condemn scotland for not getting out as long as they front up and give a pretty useful performance against ireland yeah oh, i think that's a proper that's a proper game yeah, yeah absolutely yeah. it's a live game as far as i'm concerned oh, yeah good game yeah we've got a couple of them this weekend um i think what you've just said brendan pretty much proves just how exceptional a circumstance having this group is and how yeah fortunate Scotland who had they been on the other side of the draw you wouldn't bet against them for a World Cup semi-final for sure that would uh, be a decent shout yeah anyway that's you know we've had that debate several times um, they would have been favourites in the other half of the draw they would have been favourites for every game they played yeah exactly until they got to the semi-final yeah oh no sure yeah, yeah. absolutely but they would have been favourites against Wales or probably the Wallabies in, in fact, Walker Old Boys would be favourite against the Wallabies at the moment, um, and and they 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 would have been favourites against the Pumas or and, pro and probably England the way they went into the tournament. Yeah, yeah. No. so they they have drawn the really crappy end of the stick in yeah. this. Trip. So you know, England's games against Scotland, uh, Chris. You know, I mean, they would be favourites to beat England without a shadow. Wrong of... favourites. Yeah. Like the England are their bunnies. Yeah, yeah, they are at the moment. How many in a row is it now? Oh, I don't know. It's three or four, isn't it? Yeah, it is something like that. Um, speaking of England, obviously, a bit of a weird one. England have now qualified, um, and they did so without having to play a game this weekend. Japan ousted Samoa, which means Japan will play Argentina in what is effectively a shootout for that final qualifying spot. Nick, we've spoken about injuries already this podcast, and I don't want to sort of force the issue too much, but England Samoa is a little bit of a dead rubber, let's be honest. Do you protect? Do you mix and match, given that they've already had a fortnight off? Do you try and test your team for the quarterfinal? It is it is a little bit of an interesting one for Steve Borthwick. Then after a two-week break, I think that the idea of England not putting out... I mean, <laughs> there's still a, a, a big debate over what what England's best team is. So, you know, who you rest and who you don't is um, is one thing. But, I mean, I, I think that after a two-week break, England against Samoa, England have got to put out pretty well their starting 15 for the quarterfinal game. You know, I don't see, I don't see how they, you know, they cannot do that. Um, you know, I think that they need to work. They're still not a team... In which all the systems, you know, are, are, are linked in gear. Um, I, I, I definitely think that they need to uh, pick, you know, pick pretty well the the team that starts against if 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 it's Fiji, which it looks like being. They've got to do that. I mean, Tom Curry's only played ninety seconds of rugby in this tournament. He's, yeah. you know, he has to play. And then, you know, we might finally see what England think their first choice back row is. I've got no idea whatsoever what it is at the moment. You, you, you wouldn't put your money apart from possibly second row, where you assume it's OJ and Chesham are ahead of the, the field as that partnership. Every other unit in the side's up in the air, isn't it? Mm. 
I mean, I mean, it may not be up in the air from Borthwick's point of view. He may know exactly what he's doing. But I mean, well, from the outside looking in, I wouldn't want to put m- much of the money that the rugby paper doesn't pay me on picking on picking any of uh, those those units. I wouldn't I wouldn't be terribly certain about any of them. Yeah, the optimist I mean, in me would like to think that Mitchell and Ford is settled at nine and ten. The optimist, and I'm willing to put myself on the cross when Fowl gets announced at ten there. But that that might be the only other unit I I reckon we could put some money on. I'll tell you what, Ollie. I think that Fitzy talks about the fact that Sam Kane being on the bench might be a, a good thing for New Zealand. I think that the chances of of Owen Farrell being on the bench are nil. <laughs> I think he will be he will be in the starting lineup. I don't know whether he'll be at ten, but if he's not at ten, he'll be at twelve. I don't see any way that Borthwick, given everything that he's said, I don't see any way that he's not going to be in the side. No, I agree with that. I just think he'll be at twelve. Yeah, well, probably. But um, any, any anyway, you're right. It's a good chance for um, England to get combination settled. Look, I'm conscious of time because we've been recording for a, an hour already, and I still need to get your moments of the round, your players of the round, and your matches of the round. Um, can I get two predictions off you guys? Japan, Argentina, and Scotland, Ireland, the two shootouts. First of all, is anyone predicting Scotland? No, but a hell of a match. <laughs> One no, I, I, I think we're all backing Ireland. I, 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 th- I, th- I think it's, I, I genuinely think it's a sort of 53-47 game. It's a little bit, a bit, a little bit like the Scottish independence vote. Actually, it's one of those fifty-two forty-eights or whatever. I can see how Scotland win the game. Uh, I, I, I just think that on the balance of probabilities, Ireland will be too organised and too precise and accurate for them. But if everything goes Scotland's way, then then it's it's a proper game. I, I go Ireland, but it's a proper game. If, if Scotland can take their chances, like Ireland will then Scotland are definitely a, uh, a a dark horse and and they could win it. But they usually do not finish enough of their chances. Yeah, I think I agree with all of that. Um, I think if Scotland are clinical, they could pose it. But thank you for selling it because you're right, it is probably the game of the weekend and certainly one of the games of the tournament so far. Now, Japan-Argentina... I would, on paper, Argentina are probably favourites. Is anyone backing Japan? Me. I'm, I'm going to lob in Japan just for the fun because Argentina have been totally underwhelming. I don't know what's up with them. Japan are getting a little bit ahead of steam and what a, what a good tournament team they've been in 2015, 2019 and again now. So we could do with a bit of a, a, bit of a shock in this tournament. I'd just like to think Japan might nick that one. So um, let, let, let's go for Japan on that one. Chris, are you Japaning as well? I am. I am. I, I don't think Argentina have been very good at all. Uh, in fact, I think they've been really disappointing. Um, and I think, and and the the flip side of that is Japan have been significantly better than I feared they would be. Um, they've got they've got a bit of life about them, the Japanese. I, 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 I and they have the kind of game, precisely the kind of game that can. You know, if Argentina are going to do the, the whole Carrera thing and and start chucking the ball around and and play a slightly more extravagant style than Puma sides of old, then Japan will love it. Hmm. If if they if they pick Sanchez and say we're going to ram it up your shirts all uh, for the next eighty minutes, then Japan will struggle. Yeah, uh, uh, I'm not I'm not sure I'm not sure Checker's in a Sanchez mood at the moment. Yeah. Go for the. I'll go for the Argies, whether he's in a in a Sanchez mood or not. <laughs> <laughs> Mister Sensible, Captain Sensible. Yeah, absolutely, we've got that lunatic fringe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Idiots at the back of the classroom. <laughs> as as I remember it, um, Captain Sensible, the bass player of the Damned, that was that that that, that wasn't a genuine description. <laughs> That was irony, Nick. So for Nick came to be described as Captain Sensible, yeah. it, the world is... Uh, I know. like it. I like it. <laughs> but I, I definitely, I'll go with Argentina. I think that they have been really poor. Um, but I, I do think that, they, that, that they've they they got a performance in them somewhere. they got so many fans <laughs> in France <laughs> that they've got to bloody well raise a gallop. <laughs> I think 
<laughs> will be it. Um, otherwise, they'll be lynched. <laughs> it certainly will. I'm I'm gonna go Argentina as well. So we're split two and two down the middle, like you, Nick. I think they've got a performance somewhere. Although I have to say, Japan did Japan's first tr- two tries against Samoa were fantastic. Um, so that'll be a good one to watch and maybe potentially a more difficult one to call. Um, before I move on to the moments of the round, Brendan, I'm sure you'll want to sing Portugal's praises for some of the rugby they played yesterday. Oh, again, uh, what, what a delight they are. Um, just just the basics, actually, the basic handling, except for the last 10 minutes. They dropped a couple of passes, they'll be, they'll be ruined. But a breath of fresh air got absolutely nothing from the ref, who is a fine ref, and I've been singing his praises for a couple of years, but he lost it a bit, and he let Joy Neville take over. Joy Neville was having a nightmare as well. Missed a load of no-arm tackles from the Aussies. Downgraded a yellow that should have been a yellow to a penalty. Um, and I think that was probably a penalty try as well. So they, they got nothing from the ref. That's not to say, I hate to say through gritted teeth. I mean, Australia are much improved from their first uh, couple of games or three matches. There was no there was no great um, injustice done, but it should have been much closer. It was a harsh, harsh scoreline for Portugal. And they, they, they undoubted the crowd favourites, without a doubt. They love them. Yeah, it was it was intriguing, you know, because the Portuguese seem to have changed one of, uh, one of their props or whatever. The Australian scrum was, they, you know, they were improved in many respects, but the Australian scrummaging was still rank. It was really poor, and you, you know, or, or Portugal are bloody good. Maybe, may, you know, maybe Portugal are good. My um, the there was one pass when they scored uh, the opening try the pass by their captain, Thomas Appleton, off his left hand um, was a 20... Fizzle. Absolute point. fizzle, wasn't it? Hit the, the winger Bethancourt at full tilt. It was a fantastic pass, one of the best passes of the of the tournament. So that's that's um, one of my highlights of the round, for sure. Bettered only by Gwedez Souza's or Souza's Gwedez out the back behind oh. the yeah. <laughs> spin pass. That was a big... Oh, look. Had They've been a great, great um, uh, advertisement for the tier, tier two and for rugby. They've played some terrific rugby. And um, they've, they've also got a huge fan base, as far as I can see. In San Etienne, the, the, the stadium was almost all Portuguese, as far as I can tell. Unbelievable. Yeah. And obviously, Fiji are going to have something to fear this weekend. That's a banana skin, isn't it? I don't think it's a serious banana skin, but it's going to be a wonderful match. I mean, that it's going to be as close to a 15 a size seven match as you'll ever see in Test Rugby. Yeah. I mean, Fiji looked to me against Georgia. I thought that the Georgians were really gritty and they really uh, put it on uh, on Fiji. And the Fijians showed what everybody's been saying is that they now have that set piece element to their game uh, that is is good enough to actually win games. What intrigues me is who England are going to pick to scrummage against Fiji, who've got two uh, front rows of equal calibre, both of which I'd say are currently better than England's. I'd say it's got to be the old men, Marla and Cole, to start. (laughs) (laughs) Mr. Sensible. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. (laughs) Right, guys, the time has come for your matches of the round. There, were, there isn't a standout, standout candidate this time. Mine would be South Africa versus Tonga last night, um, which I thought was absolutely brutal and great to watch. Would anyone like to add another game to that? Yeah, I'd, I'd, listen, I, I mean, I'd, I'd say too, I thought that the Fiji-Georgia was a really... You know, it was a heavy duty physical game and the Fijians were not playing well and they dug in and the two tries that they scored, you know, for Naya Salevo to manage to stay in touch and ground the ball. And then Bottier again, you know, not showing that he's not just a, a, a breakdown maestro, he's also able to suck in, suck in five defenders and then lay the ball off beautifully for the try, you know, I mean... Yeah, I, I go, I go, I agree with Nick. That was that was my game in the round, actually. Fiji, Georgia, J- just because it was fascinating to see Fiji with a target on their back yeah. and how they'd respond. And you know, the weight of expectation was on them, and it never is. 
It never is. They it also never... looked as if they'd been playing frisbee on the beach for bloody two weeks. Oh, which I think they had been looking from, from their social the media. Was the time. <laughs> it's, it's, it's perfectly possible. But I thought both sides brought a hell of a lot to that game in, in, their, in their different ways. And Georgia always sort of fly under the radar, don't they? And no one really talks about them very much. But but they 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 play blinders at these World Cups. I mean, they're, they're terrifically committed and, and pretty well organised, pretty well coached and organised. They have their limitations. But it, I, I thought that was a really interesting game. Yeah, I mean, defensively, I, I mean, uh, 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 Doff of the uh, captain, Joe Worsley, I mean, defensively, yeah. they were bloody good. They mm -hmm. really were yeah. good. Yeah. And they're very legal tacklers. You rarely see a, a Georgian making anything remotely like a dodgy tackle. They go low, like Joe did all his life. Joe yeah. was the great chopper, wasn't he? Absolutely. Having said that, I'm going to go with Ollie for match. I, that, I sat down, I wasn't intending to watch that match really last night, South Africa. I mean, you know, we will watch a lot of rugby at the moment, uh, which doesn't always go down well at home. I wasn't going to watch that and I got sucked into it. I just thought it was a wonderful match to watch. And um, I was so pleased to see Tonga finally fulfil, because we know that some of those guys are really good players and, you know, we've discussed all the circumstances behind it, but they are finally clicking. And they are finally looking like a serious team. I mean, they've, they've done it a couple of times with Tongans, haven't they, back in the day? But it, they, they just tend to be very isolated peaks. I mean, they beat France, I have they a feeling, uh, and, and gave South Africa a real hurry up in, in 2011, or, yeah. or 2007, was it one or two? Um, just just Seven, yeah. back to what you said about the Georgians and and, and ne never committing, um, or very rarely committing about uh, an illegal tackle. Sometimes you wish they would, because for any referee to turn around to a bloke and say, name, please, would be very funny. <laughs> <laughs> Does it end in Ashvili or Adza? <laughs> um, well, yes. yes it, it's five syllables before those are the problem, I think you'll find, but it's, uh, um, none of which have a vowel in them. <laughs> so when they say no to my question, then it becomes easy. <laughs> I think they had one player in their team that didn't have that suffix um, on Saturday. <laughs> uh, using the South Africa Tonga game as a feeder into the player of the week of the round of the weekend, um, I'm going to give a shout out to a player on the losing side, Ben Tami Funa. I agree. Defied well, belief in terms of his dedication. I mean, he only played 55 minutes. It felt like he gave about 80 minutes work into 55 minutes. That's a that's a brilliant suggestion, Ollie. He he um. He seems such a, I mean, talk about popular, that guy's got a fan club. I think the South Africans loved him afterwards as well. And, you know, for a big guy, he's actually got himself very fit. And he's extraordinarily nimble in that little sort of, you know, in the traffic. He's a really good operator. Did did I hear correctly um, on, on the TV commentary that Oxen Che was giving him six stone? <laughs> he was actually giving him six stone in the scrum. What? How much does Oxen Che weigh? Well, plenty. Well, yeah, I didn't think he was that light. I mean, I know Tammy Funa is 155 odd or whatever. Yeah, I mean, I mean, he's significantly heavier than Antonio. Yeah, yeah, he is. He is. Okay, okay. And, anyway, I mean, I mean they call him the wardrobe. He looks like he swallowed one. <laughs> <laughs> so apparently, Oxen Che. Yeah, you're right. 115 kilos. I'm sure. Sorry, Ox. I'm sure. I'm sure he's more than that. But damn, I, I reckon that that's just one of those, uh, you know, messing around with the stats. I think he's yeah. a lot more than that a lot heavier. Yeah, um, you don't get many hundred sub hundred and fifteen kilo South Africa props, do you? No, no, no. I look, look. Just on on the player, I, I think just coming back to Portugal, Appleton, the guy that I mentioned before, he's their captain. A team plays like that. You know, obviously the captain's a significant part of the way that they do it, Lajiske uh, as well. But Am Appleton is also defensively one of the best centres I've, I've seen in the tournament. His ta he, he, is, he, t he tackles he tackles very, very correctly most of the time and is a very, very good defensive centre. So, you know, uh, 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 hats off to him because Portugal have been one of the what really one of the um, the big pluses of this of this tournament, I think. And and the ten is a good player as well. Yeah, very good. Yeah, he's yeah. good. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I know, I know they 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 sort of shape their game to bring out the best for him, but he's um, I've been really impressed with him. Yeah, and the seven uh, Martin, although yeah. he, he stuffed up a try, um, but 
no, all round they've been they've been a revelation, really. Yeah. Mm. It'll be good to see them again in four years' time. See what they can do the next time they play a tier one team. <laughs> Any other players to shout out before we move on to moment of the round? Well, uh, Botia. Botia was quite good. Quite good. <laughs> by, his, <laughs> by his standards, so excellent by most yeah. Of the standards. Yeah, he's the only, he's the only rugby player I've ever seen, apart from William Webb Ennis, who actually looks older than Mako Vunapola. <laughs> Do you not call yourself a rugby player then, Chris? No. Believe me, I was never very few people, very few people have thrown that description at me. <laughs> you were saying a couple of weeks ago you could tackle two us over. I don't know what's changed. Well, well, absolutely. And it is also true that out of the the that one of me and Jeremy Guscott captain Walker Old Boys, and it wasn't Jeremy Guscott. <laughs> and you said that the old boys would beat Australia right now. Well, that's true. Well, that's just, yeah. a, that's just a statement of fact. I mean, how, it, seriously, how bad how poor are they? Yeah, I know. I, I, I mean, Eddie Jones, uh, Eddie Jones, at the end of that game, there was a shot of him on the TV just shaking everyone warmly by the hand. Now, there's two ways of looking at that. One is that's the end of, you know, that's, it. Well. that's as far as we go, or that's me off. I don't know. I mean, who the hell knows what's going on there? That is a complete shambles. Yeah, well, the, the Japan rumours certainly seem to have sources and substance, um, as much as Eddie says he doesn't know what they're talking about. But we will have an Australia-themed episode in the coming weeks. Um, Campo has said that he will come back on, so we will we'll save that conversation. Yeah. I suspect Ed Eddie's minutes. responses to all those questions are almost as convincing as Richie Sunak's answers to the questions about hs2 chris stop making everything political <laughs> it's all politics everything everything's everything's, yes. everything's politics oh my God. And, unless you're talking about boris johnson <laughs> i might have to exercise my right to mute you in a second chris that's absolutely fine and, and, and of course you have the editors um exactly you're in, you're in the editor's chair so that's fine but it's I'll get all GB news on you if you try and edit me out. <laughs> Come on, let's not drag this out any further, for God's sake. Moment of the round. I've Mike given... Tager. Mike Tager. Nice. Absolutely. I mean, ju just just his last his last few minutes and what have you, and then just when he walked off the field to a to a great ovation, and it was thoroughly deserved. He played amazingly well. Uh, for 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 Portugal, absolutely terrific. Completely committed to the cause, and uh, had the warmest reception when he when he walked off, and and that was quite that was quite touching actually because he played the house down. I'd like to underscore at this point that we aren't a Portugal affiliated podcast because we <laughs> we have been very much. Brendan, you're muted. We've only been doing this ninety times. Brendan, you're still muted. And he's still muted. <laughs> oh, are we still muted now? No, sadly. I, I just want to refute the suggestion that we're not affiliated to the Portuguese rugby union. We obviously <laughs> are. I mean, no, we, and to be fair, one or two of us have been beating the, bum, uh, the drum of Portugal for about three years. Yeah. So this is not a surprise to some. <laughs> no, not a surprise, no. But we are singing their praises for good reason, not just Portuguese bias. Um, Brendan, your moment at the weekend? Well, I was very tempted actually to go with Chris's, I thought that was a lovely moment, as was Big Ben coming off last night. I'm going to go for a moment rather than the moment. Um, a classic sliding doors moment. 9-0 before half-time. Georgia attacking, counter-attacking, um, ball runs loose and they run in for a try. For me, it was a, it would have been 16-0 at half-time. And, and Dixon immediately calls it forward. It wasn't forward. He, it, and he, he didn't stop to even think and consider the possibility he got it wrong. The pass was given a foot this side of the five-metre line, was taken two foot this side of the five-metre line. If that's a forward pass, you're going to have to scrub off 30 or 40 pass or tries already in this tournament. And that was such an important moment. If Georgia had gone down the tunnel 16 nil up, then we really would have had a test of what Fiji are made of. So just one of those moments, you know, it'll be forgotten. It's probably already forgotten with you lot already. But... That, that could have been George's World Cup there, that, that win. And they'll be talking about it in 10 years' time, even, even if we aren't. 
yeah, you're right. That would have been a landscape changer for Paul C, wouldn't it? Yeah. Nick? I've already given it, Ollie. What did you say? I said... Uh, Appleton's Pass. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Awesome. Right, well, that round... Oh, I haven't given mine. Um, I'm going to go... Well, I thought all the... I'm, I'm going to be biased towards South Africa Tonga again, which I've sort of used for all of my um, answers. But the the moments post-game, South Africa Tonga, just all of it. Tammy Funa and Khaleesi's shirt swap, which was hilarious because Khaleesi was then wearing effectively a dress. Meanwhile, I don't know what happened with Tammy Funa putting Khaleesi's shirt on. Someone needs to find a picture of what happened there because we saw Khaleesi put Tammy Funa's on and then we didn't see the inverse, but hey-ho. And then also the the huddle and the prayer together, which yeah. I always find incredibly powerful. Cool. That wraps us up this week. Um, I'll see you guys. Yeah, the pool stage will be done by the time we we meet next, next Monday, and we'll know who our quarterfinalists are. So we'll see you next week to look forward to those games. The rugby just keeps on coming at the moment and the Guinness Six Nations is just around the corner and will be upon us before we know it. Make it a year to remember by booking official hospitality with our friends at Keith Prowse, principal sales partner to England Rugby Hospitality. Their matchday experiences have a whole range of incredible features from complimentary bars to menus designed by Michelin star chefs, namely Tom Kerridge, Ollie Dabu and Tommy Banks. So book your experience now and make memories that will last a lifetime. Visit keithprowse.co.uk forward slash Twickenham now. Thanks for listening to this week's edition of the Rugby Paper Podcast. And don't forget to subscribe on whichever podcast platform you use and recommend the show to your friends. The Rugby Paper is available to buy every Sunday. And to make sure you don't miss it, subscribe to our print, digital and online options at therugbypaper.co.uk forward slash subscriptions. That's therugbypaper.co.uk forward slash subscriptions to get all our content for as little as 14p per day.